Good morning, and welcome to day three of the Patent Literacy Symposium, our final day. My name is Dr. Pam Kastner, and I have the honor of serving as Patent State Lead for Literacy. At Patent, we are fully committed to the science of reading. This symposium itself is grounded in a theoretical framework from Hollis Scarborough's Reading Rope. Today, we have the distinct honor of having Emily Hanford as our keynote speaker. Emily Hanford's documentaries have been reverberated across the world. She has had a global impact on how we teach reading. Let me tell you a bit more about Emily Hanford. Emily Hanford has been working in public media for more than two decades as a reporter, producer, editor, news director, and program host. She came to American Public Media in 2008 to produce documentaries for American Radio Works which became part of American Public Media Reports in 2016. Her work has won numerous awards and honors, including a DuPont Columbia Award, a Casey Medal, and awards from the Education Writers Association and the Associated Press. In 2017, she won the Excellence in Media Reporting on Education Research Award from the American Educational Research Association. She is a frequent speaker and moderator and host of the Ways and Means podcast. Emily is based in the Washington DC area and is a graduate of Amherst College. Please join me in welcoming Emily Hanford. I'm just sharing my screen here. Hello, everybody. Okay, I think you can see my screen. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Patton, for having me. Uh, it is an extraordinary moment in our nation's history in so many ways. I, I saw a tweet the other day that said, future historians will be asked which quarter of 2020 they specialize in. It's really quite remarkable just how much is going on. I think all of us are being confronted with uh, uncomfortable questions and painful truths. And the bottom line is that it's been time for a very long time for us to do something about the inequalities that are produced and perpetuated by our systems and our institutions, and that includes education. My remarks today are informed by what I've learned as a journalist over the past three and a half years about the science of reading. That is what scientists have figured out about how skilled reading works and what that means about what children need to learn. What I've discovered is a lot of kids are not being taught what they need to know. 65% of fourth graders in this country read at a level considered basic or below, 65%. Even more shocking is looking at those numbers by race and family income. Nearly 80% of students from low-income families are reading at basic or below, nearly 80% of Hispanic children, and more than 80% of Black children, more than 8 in 10. When children struggle with reading early in life, it can translate into big problems later on, behavior issues, depression, anxiety, lower high school graduation rates, fewer opportunities for advanced education, and an increased likelihood of ending up in the criminal justice system. But it really does not have to be this way. So over the past three and a half years, I have read thousands of pages of books, reports, and articles about how skilled reading works, uh, what kids need to learn to become skilled readers, and what's going on when children struggle to learn how to read. I've talked with hundreds of people. I've visited 10 states so far to try to understand how reading is being taught in schools today. And what I've learned has really shocked me, and it's basically this. Over the past 40 or 50 years, cognitive scientists and psychologists and neuroscientists and linguists and other researchers all over the world have conducted thousands of studies in labs and in classrooms to try to figure out how people read, what children need to learn to become good readers, and what's going on when kids struggle to learn how to read. But this mountain of scientific evidence about reading is not, for the most part, making its way into schools. Many teachers are not being taught this science in their teacher preparation programs. They're not taught this science in professional development they get on the job. In fact, some of what they learn about reading and how to teach it is actually at odds with what the scientific evidence says. Now, I didn't know any of this a few years ago. So today I'm gonna to tell you the story of what I've learned. So, there we go. So I've been a reporter for 25 years and I have covered all kinds of things, um, elections, daily news, healthcare. My first job in was covering religion, which was fascinating. And as Pam said, in 2008, I was hired to cover education for this public radio documentary program called American Radio Works. We're now called APM Reports. We're the documentary and investigative reporting group at American Public Media. And in my 12 years of reporting on education, I've been particularly interested in two things, 
how family income generally and poverty in particular affect educational opportunities and outcomes, and also how people learn, the findings from cognitive science and how those play out or not in our classrooms. So almost all of my reporting has been focused on secondary and post-secondary education. That photo of me in the classroom with the little kids was the very first reporting project I did for American Public Media. It was about preschool. But then I didn't do much of anything on early or elementary education until I got interested in reading a few years ago. And that is really when I realized that early reading instruction is where it's at if you are interested in educational equity, opportunity, and how people learn. So this, uh, this is the first reporting project that I did about reading back in 2017. I had no idea that I would still be on the same topic three years later. So Hard to Read is a podcast episode and an article about why students with dyslexia have such a hard time getting what they need in school. And it grew out of a project on higher education. I was reporting on the huge number of students who graduate from high school, go on to college, and are told that they need to take remedial classes. Basically, they're paying to do high school over again. One day I ended up in this hours long interview with a young woman who had been placed in a remedial English class and she told me that she had dyslexia. She said she had never been identified with dyslexia as a kid. She told me she didn't get any effective help with her reading problems in school. And she ended up kind of stuck. She was in college now without the reading and writing skills that she needed. So this is what got me interested in learning more about dyslexia. I told you I really knew nothing about it. And I started hearing the same story from parents all over the country, like the exact same story, the same places in the story where the parents would break down in tears and they always break down in tears. Here's how the story goes. My child started school and I knew something wasn't quite right. I went to the kindergarten teacher and she told me, don't worry, make sure you read lots of books to him, everything will be fine. But reading seemed to be really hard for him. He just kind of didn't seem to get it. I went to the first grade teacher and she said, don't worry, all kids learn differently, he'll catch up. But he didn't seem to be making much progress. By second grade, he was avoiding reading. He was telling me he didn't want to go to school. The teacher said, we just haven't found your child the right book yet. It'll all come together in time. And it went on and on like this. The parent saying something's not right, the school saying everything's fine, and the parent not knowing what to do because the schools are the education experts, right? So by now, the mom is thinking, could my child have dyslexia? But when she brings dyslexia up with the school, they tell her, no, no, we don't say that here. We don't use the word dyslexia. Maybe her child is getting pulled out of the classroom for some extra help. Maybe he gets some accommodations, like extra time on tests, maybe some audiobooks. But the boy still does not really learn how to read because he's not taught how to do it because the school does not actually know that much about how reading works, which means the school doesn't really know what's going on when a child is struggling to read, and they don't really know quite what to do about it. I took a class on the science of reading last year. Many of my classmates were teachers, and here's what they said about their preparation to teach reading. I didn't feel adequately prepared to teach reading. This is hard for me to admit because I have several degrees and felt like I should know what I was doing. I kept falsely reassuring myself my students weren't making much growth because of this reason or that reason, although deep down I feared it was me and my instruction. I wasn't adequately prepared. It's not that I didn't care, it's that I didn't know any better. And then this. I felt so angry and guilty when I was finally taught the basics of reading science. I thought, how did you let me teach literacy without knowing this? I'm going to explain some of the basics of what I've learned about the reading science in a moment, but first I want to finish the story of that worried mom with struggling reader. Here's what happens if she has the time and if she has the money. She takes things into her own hands. She might pay for private testing. That can cost thousands of dollars. She might pay for private tutoring. That can be more thousands of dollars. She might hire an educational consultant or an attorney or both to help her fight for what her child needs in public school. And all of this is not just really expensive. It's exhausting, it's frustrating, and it's really, really hard. And the mother begins to realize her child may never get what he needs in public school. Or anyway, he's not gonna get it fast enough because now he's eight or nine or 10 years old and he really doesn't like school. And he's falling behind on other subjects because he can't read well enough. Maybe he's beginning to act out in school or maybe it's manifesting as depression, anxiety, withdrawal. And maybe her child, eight or nine or 10 years old, 
has actually said to her, I want to kill myself. I have heard this from a number of parents, little kids who say they want to die because they're struggling to learn how to read. This is when, if she has the resources and the time, the mom pulls her child out of public school. Maybe she homeschools him, or maybe the family figures out a way to come up with the tens of thousands of dollars that it can cost to send the child to a specialized private school if there is a good private school nearby, and that's a big if. At one point I was with a group of moms in a dyslexia advocacy group and I realized that none of them, not a single one, had their struggling readers in public school anymore. They had all given up on the idea that public schools could help their kids learn how to read, but they were still fighting for other people's children. Here is the situation that we're in in this country. If you can come up with the money to pay for it, you can probably find a way for your struggling reader to be taught how to read. But if you don't have the money and your child is not learning to read in school, what do you do? The equity implications of this are stunning. If you're from a low or even a moderate income family, there is no safety net, there's no backup if you're not being taught to read in school. As one mom put it to me, getting help for a struggling reader is a rich man's game. Reading, the most basic, most fundamental skill, is a rich man's game how did that happen and how is it allowed to continue? That's what led me to the next reporting project called Hard Words. So this is a podcast episode and article about core reading instruction. So not what needs to be done for struggling readers in particular, but rather what do all children need to learn to become good readers? The bottom line from decades of scientific research is this. What kids with dyslexia need to learn to become good readers is not substantially different from what all people need to learn to become good readers. Kids with dyslexia may need a more intense dose of a certain kind of instruction, but all kids can benefit from the kind of instruction that kids with dyslexia desperately need. So hard words focus quite a bit on phonics instruction, and it focused on phonics instruction for two big reasons. One, Phonics has been the focus of so much debate and controversy for years, centuries. When people are arguing about reading, they're usually fighting about phonics. Two, I focused on phonics because what scientists have discovered is that phonics skills are critical when it comes to becoming a good reader. So why is that? Because the starting point for reading is sound. What a child has to figure out to become a good reader is that the words that she hears and knows how to say are made up of speech sounds. Those are phonemes. And she has to understand that in an alphabetic language like English, phonemes are represented by letters and combinations of letters. So that's like the alphabetic principle. It's something that human beings have to learn. It doesn't come naturally. Learning to read is not like learning to speak. So if you immerse a child in an environment of spoken language, unless she has a hearing problem or some other severe impairment, she is going to learn to speak her native language. That's not the case with reading. Immersing children in a literate environment is not enough. We aren't born with brains that are wired to read. Learning to read is not a natural process. That's one of the big takeaways from the scientific research on reading. And why aren't we born wired to read? Because reading is kind of new. Human beings invented written language just a few thousand years ago, which is really recently in the course of evolutionary history. So children need to be taught how their written language works. Some children need very little instruction but some children need quite a lot. So many of you have probably seen this and I, you're gonna hear from Nancy or maybe you already did. So this slide was made by Nancy Young and it compiles estimates from a number of studies and it, basically, it shows that about, no one knows for sure, but roughly 40% of kids are gonna to learn to read no matter how you teach them. So a little bit of instruction and immersion in a literate environment, which is important, that's probably gonna do the job for about 40% of kids. But most children, right? More than half are not going to learn to read well unless they're explicitly taught how their written language works. And some kids are going to need a lot of instruction. So a key thing for everyone to understand is that all kids can benefit from explicit instruction. Even those kids who may not need it to be able to make sense of text can become better readers and better spellers if they're taught how their written language works. So what I tried to explain in hard words is why phonics instruction matters so much. Good phonics instruction does not equal good reading instruction. No one who knows the scientific research says that or advocates for that. But schools that are not teaching phonics in a direct and systematic way are not giving all kids a fair shot 
at becoming good readers. Australian researchers Anne Kessels and Jennifer Buckingham summed it up this way in an article. They wrote, when children begin school, we cannot predict with sufficient accuracy which children will struggle to learn to read without explicit systematic phonics instruction and which will not. Therefore, the most ethical and prudent action is to provide all children with the most effective teaching methods based on the best available evidence, thereby accelerating the progress of all children and minimizing the likelihood that any child will struggle to learn to read. Again, no one is arguing that phonics instruction is all children need to become good readers. There is much more to the science of reading than just phonics. There always has been. In fact, one of the primary questions for reading scientists when the field began to establish back in the 1970s was, what is the role of decoding and reading? And what else do people need to be able to do to comprehend what they read? So a good place to begin, many of you have probably seen this, this is the simple view of reading. Some of you probably know this a lot better than I do. The simple view was first proposed in 1986 by research researchers Philip Goff and William Tummer. They proposed this model because they were trying to clarify the role of decoding in reading comprehension. Everyone agrees that the goal of reading is to comprehend text. The question is, how does a little kid get there? The simple view says that reading comprehension is the product of two things. One is your ability to decode words. So you see the letter string R-E-A-D-I-N-G, and you know that that string of letters represents the word reading. The other part of the equation is your language comprehension. That's your ability to understand spoken language. So we're not talking about your ability to read text. Language comprehension is your ability to understand meaning when someone is talking or when text is being read out loud to you. So for example, when someone says to you, she is reading the book, you know what the verb means in that sentence. You know what she's doing. The simple view says that if you have really good language comprehension, but zero decoding skills, your reading comprehension will be zero because zero times anything is zero. The simple view also says that if you have really good decoding skills, but very poor language comprehension, you just don't know the meaning of that many words in spoken language, your reading comprehension is not gonna be very good either. So here's that, how this applies to learning how to read. Most kids entering school have very little when it comes to the decoding part of the equation. They have zero or close to zero when it comes to the D in the simple view of reading. But they do have something when it comes to the language comprehension part of the equation. In other words, when children enter school, they know the meaning of lots of words, but they don't know how to decode those words yet. This is why people familiar with the science of reading call for an emphasis on phonics instruction in the early grades. Because if the goal is to get to reading comprehension and you have a bunch of five and six year olds before you with language comprehension skills, but virtually no decoding skills, what do you do, need to do to help those children get to reading comprehension? You need to help those children develop decoding skills. What you wanna focus on with beginning readers is getting their decoding skills up to the level of their language comprehension. Now the simple view, clearly shows that focusing only on decoding would be a very big mistake because that's only half the equation. And as everyone knows, kids come into school with very different language comprehension skills. Some kids know the meaning of lots and lots of words. Some kids have far smaller vocabularies. So reading instruction that aligns with the simple view has to focus on the language comprehension part of the equation too. So this includes lessons and activities that expand children's oral vocabularies. I was in a first grade classroom in Oakland, California, where reading instruction was deliberately aligned with the simple view. So what I saw was explicit phonics instruction in one part of the reading instruction with kids broken into small groups, depending on the level of their decoding skills. And kids were not just being taught skills, they were given lots of time to practice the skills they'd learned by reading books. And another part of the reading instruction was explicit vocabulary lessons and lots of reading aloud by the teacher. So the words that the kids had learned were posted on cards all over the classroom. It was near the end of the year, so they were starting to cover the windows. And they included words like extraordinary, gigantic, neighborly, and ridiculous. So those are not words that the vast majority of first grades are gonna be able to decode, and they shouldn't be expected to. But the first graders in this class were learning the pronunciation and meaning of these words so that when they're able to read them, they'll know what the words mean. By the way, every single child in this class spoke a language other than English at home, and many of them, for many of them, English was actually their third language. 
So the simple view was proposed as a theoretical model back in 1986, and the basics of this model have been confirmed by research over and over again since. And I think the simple view is really helpful because it disentangles some of the stuff that is most contentious in the debates about reading. In what's known as the whole language view and in the balanced literacy view more recently, but the focus right from the start of reading instruction should be on getting kids to focus on the meaning of what they're reading. So whole language and balanced literacy are meaning emphasis approaches to reading instruction, as opposed to what's known as a code emphasis approach, which emphasizes decoding skills at the beginning of reading instruction. So early reading instruction that aligns with science is a code emphasis approach so that kids can get to meaning. Everyone agrees that meaning's the goal. The question again is, how does a little kid get there? So this is Scarborough's rope, Pam mentioned. I'm sure all of you know this rope, and if you didn't before the beginning of this uh, conference, you do now. So it's, it's sort of another model for understanding how skilled reading works. Uh, Hollis Scarborough is a psychologist at Haskins Labs, and she's been studying reading development since the 1980s. So Scarborough's rope helps unpack what goes into each side of the equation put forth in the simple view. So the upper strand is language comprehension. This model shows that language comprehension is complex. It's not just all the words you know the meaning of an oral language, it's also your level of knowledge. It's the stuff you know. It's your understanding of how language works, language structure, grammar, uh, your ability to make inferences, understand things like metaphors. So this is sort of a more nuanced explanation of what goes into the language comprehension part of the simple view equation. And it can help teachers understand what might be going on when kids are decoding well, but they're still struggling with reading comprehension. Very often, they have some kind of language comprehension issue. The lower strand of Scarborough's rope is the word recognition strand. So like the simple view of reading, Scarborough's rope shows that without good word recognition skills, you're not going to become a very good reader. And the rope unpacks the various skills and abilities that go into word recognition. So you can see that one element is decoding. That's basically your phonics knowledge. Do you have a good understanding of how letters and combinations of letters represent the sounds in words? Teaching students the basic letter sound combinations in the English language gives them access to successfully sounding out more than 80% of the words in English print. But that's not all the words. Children need more than just phonics knowledge to be successful with written English. So I think it's more useful, this is a term I used earlier, it's more useful to think about teaching children how their written language works. Because English spelling is not just based on the sounds and words. English is a morphophonemic language, meaning our spelling patterns are based on both sounds and meanings. So to really understand English spelling, kids should be taught some morphology. In other words, they need to understand something about the meaningful parts of words and how English words are put together. And some etymology helps too. So to understand English spelling, it's really helpful to know something about the history of the language. Where did these spelling patterns come from? English has a reputation for being this wacky language that's full of exceptions, but it's not. It's like this melting pot language that has complex spelling patterns because English has roots in all these other languages, in Greek and Latin and French and more. So written English is perhaps the most difficult alphabetic language to learn. It takes two to three years for a typically developing reader to master the basics of written English. In contrast, it takes only a few months for most kids in Italy, for example, to learn how to decode Italian because Italian spelling is almost perfectly regular. Italian is spelled the way it sounds. So one of the reasons I think that we have fought so much about reading instruction in the English speaking world, because it's all over the English speaking world, this fight, and I think we are arguing about it because there's a lot to teaching children written English. So there's a lot to argue about in terms of how to teach it. And there's a lot to figure out. So back to Scarborough's rope and the elements of the word recognition strand. So there's phonological awareness, understanding the sounds and words. There's decoding, understanding how letters represent those sounds. And there is also something called sight recognition of familiar words. And this, in my opinion, is where things get really interesting. When you're a skilled reader, you don't actually have to decode most of the words you encounter. When you see a word that you've read several times before, you know the word immediately on sight. You don't have to sound it out. Scientists refer to the words that are instantly recognizable to us as sight words. Now the term sight words can be really confusing because teachers and reading scientists usually mean different things when they use that term. 
So in schools, sight words are typically words kids are supposed to memorize. But what the science shows is that having kids memorize lots of words is not the best path to good word recognition skills. And it turns out that weak word recognition skills are the most common and most debilitating source of reading problems. Struggling readers may also have other issues. They may have language comprehension issues, but when children do not get off to a good start with decoding, it has an impact on the continued development of their language comprehension. And eventually kids may be weak on the language comprehension side because they're weak on the word recognition side. This problem has been described as the Matthew effect. It's a biblical reference. So basically when it comes to reading, the rich get richer. And here's how it works. If you come into school with lots of language comprehension, but you struggle with learning how to decode words, your ability to continue to develop language comprehension may be impeded because one of the best ways to increase your knowledge and your vocabulary and your reasoning and your understanding of the structure of language is through reading. In contrast, if you come into school weak on the language comprehension side, but you're taught how to decode, you have just been given the gift that is your best bet for gaining knowledge and vocabulary because you can decode the words. This is why equity in education begins with good phonics instruction in the early grades. It is one of the most important things teachers can do to try to even the playing field between kids who come from homes that give them an edge on the language comprehension side and kids who come from homes that may not be as rich and resourced when it comes to vocabulary development and access to knowledge. Good phonics instruction is where educational equity begins. It doesn't end there, but it's a critical foundation. Now, the good news is that most schools seem to be doing some kind of phonics instruction these days. Most publishers and authors of curriculum materials seem to know that if their stuff is going to have a chance of being considered research-based, there has to be some phonics. And if they didn't know that or believe it until recently, they're quickly adding a phonics component now. So that means we must be on the right path, that reading instruction is finally starting to line up with the science. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, because while more and more schools are adding a phonics block, what I also see in schools are things like this. <clears throat> so you've probably seen these. These are word reading strategies that you will find in schools all over the country. I have seen these strategies everywhere on posters in classrooms, bookmarks that get sent home with kids. They're on Pinterest, they're on Teachers Pay Teachers. I've also seen things like this. So these are all strategies for kids to use when they're reading and they come to a word they don't know. And these strategies seem sensible enough. You get to a word you don't know, what can you do? You can look at the picture and try to figure out what the word might be. You don't want to completely guess, so you can look at the first letter. You can, you can look at how the word begins. That will narrow your choices. You can then check to see if you're right. Reread the sentence using the word, see if the sentence makes sense. And if you're stuck, you can just skip the word and move on. Hopefully you can get the gist of the sentence anyway. What's the theory of how reading works that these strategies are based on? What's the idea about how kids learn to read words? Those are the questions that I became very interested in as a reporter. So these strategies are rooted in a theory about reading that came to be known as three cueing. So the basic idea is that readers use three different kinds of information or cues to identify words as they're reading. So the idea was originally proposed by the late Ken Goodman back in 1967 at the American Educational Research Association Conference in New York. He laid out the original theory in a paper that he called Reading, a Psycholinguistic Guessing Game. In the paper, Goodman rejected the idea that reading is a precise process that involves exact or detailed perception of letters or words. Instead, he argued that as people read, they make predictions about the words on the page using these three cues. So graphic cues, what do the letters tell you about what the word might be? Syntactic cues, what kind of a word could it be? For example, a noun or a verb and semantic cues, what word would make sense here based on the context. So in his paper, Goodman concluded this. He wrote, skill in reading involves not greater precision, but more accurate first guesses based on better sampling techniques, greater control over language structure, broadened experiences, and increased conceptual development. As the child develops reading skill and speed, he uses increasingly fewer graphic cues. 
So this was kind of a new twist on prevailing ideas about how reading works. And it went on to become a theoretical basis of the whole language approach to teaching reading. For the couple of centuries previous to the introduction of whole language back in the 1960s, 70s, the debate about how reading works and how to teach it had focused on one of two big ideas. So one idea is that reading is a visual memory process. The teaching method associated with this idea is the whole word method. It's not quite the same as whole language, so whole word. The basic idea is that if you see words enough and you associate the words with their meaning, you eventually store those words in your memory as like visual images. So this is the idea behind long lists of sight words that kids are supposed to memorize. The other idea is that reading requires knowledge of the relationships between sounds and letters, and that the way to identify a word is to sound it out. That's the phonics approach, basically. So reading instruction was really a series of pendulum swings between whole word and phonics until this new idea came along that said people don't read by sounding out words and they don't read by memorizing words as wholes either. Instead, they use this cueing system. That is, they use context to predict what the words will be and they use the letters to check their predictions. Many teachers know this cueing theory of word reading. They've never heard of three cueing, but they know this other thing called MSV. So M is for using meaning to figure out what a word is. S is for using syntax or sentence structure. And V is for using visual information. That is the letters in the word. You will find this MSV idea in lots of curriculum materials that define themselves as balanced literacy. You can trace the roots of this MSV idea back to the work of a woman named Mari Clay. Mari Clay was a developmental psychologist in New Zealand who came up with ideas about reading that were similar to Ken Goodman's ideas at about the same time. They didn't develop these ideas together. They didn't agree on everything, but they did meet and travel in similar literacy circles in the 1980s and 90s. Clay built her ideas into a reading intervention program for struggling first graders called Reading Recovery. Reading Recovery was implemented across New Zealand in the 1980s, and it went on to become one of the most widely used reading intervention programs in the world. Clay's theories about reading were popularized as part of core reading instruction here in the United States by Irene Fountas and Gay Sue Pinnell. They learned from Clay in the 1980s. Fountas and Pinnell are very well known in education for an approach to reading instruction known as guided reading for a widely used assessment system that uses what are known as leveled books, the benchmark assessment system. And Fountas and Pinnell also sell a reading intervention program called Leveled Literacy Intervention or LLI. Education Week did a survey of elementary school teachers last fall and they found that 43%, 43% of elementary school teachers reported using LLI. You will find lots of examples of that meaning, structure, visual idea in Fountas and Pinnell books, products, and materials. You will also find MSV and queuing in the Units of Study series written by Lucy Calkins. She's a professor at Teachers College Columbia. Units of Study is more commonly referred to as Reader's Workshop. According to the Ed Week survey that I just mentioned, 16% of teachers reported using units of study to teach reading. That makes it the third most widely used set of materials for teaching reading in this country. You will find some phonics in the Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell approaches. In fact, Lucy Calkins recently created a units of study for teaching phonics programs. Fountas and Pinnell have books and materials to teach phonics too. They have for a long time. But phonics is often presented as one way to know what a word is. It's one strategy. It's that third cue in the three cueing system. What schools need to know is that when they buy materials from Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell, they're buying an approach to teaching reading that is rooted in a particular theory, a particular theory about how reading works. And it's this idea that skilled readers use meaning and context to identify words as they read. So what you are likely to find in a lot of American classrooms today is 20 or 30 minutes of a phonics program and then readers workshop or guided reading where kids are taught that when they come to a word they don't know, they can sound it out and use what they've learned in their phonics lessons, but they can also use other strategies. They can think about a word that makes sense, they can look at the first letter of the word, or they can just take a page from Skippy the Frog and skip the word altogether. So the question really is, what's wrong with this? Like, why not teach kids lots of strategies to help them when they come to a word they don't know? It seems sensible. But the answer comes back to the scientific research on reading and how it works. So, what is going on in these little boys' brains as they're learning to read? And the thing is that for a long time, a very long time, no one knew. But 
as you know, scientists in labs and classrooms all over the world have done a mountain of studies over the past several decades about how skilled reading works. And here is a key thing that they figured out. Skilled readers do not use cues and context to read words. In fact, what scientists have discovered is that this is how poor readers read. Poor readers tend to have a hard time with word identification. Too many of the words they come across are series of letters they don't immediately know and maybe can't quite figure out. So they use a bunch of other strategies to try to understand what the words say. They memorize as many words as they can. When they come across a word they don't know, they look at the first letter, first few letters, they try to think of a word that makes sense. In other words, they use context to try to come up with a word that fits. And when they can't figure out what a word is using context clues, they skip the word. Often, they can get the gist of what they're reading this way. But using context, guessing and skipping words, this is not what reading is like when you're a skilled reader. What cognitive scientists have figured out is that a key difference between skilled readers and unskilled readers is that skilled readers can immediately and accurately recognize words. They don't need to guess or predict or use context. Skilled readers know tens of thousands of words instantly on site. In fact, if you're a skilled reader, your brain has gotten so good at reading words that you process the word book faster than you process a picture of a book. How did your brain get so good at that? Because as we know, we're not born with brains that are designed to do this. So how do our brains get so good at reading words? It happens through this process called orthographic mapping. And that term sounds so complex and weedy and intimidate, you know, weedy, intimidating, and it really is, but it's really, really crucial, I think. I think educators have to understand just the basics of orthographic mapping to understand why phonics is so important and to understand why teaching all those word reading strategies is not a good idea. So here is a quick and simplified explanation of what orthographic mapping is. So orthographic mapping is the process we use to store printed words in our long-term memory. So this is not about memorizing words. The way you orthographically map a word to your memory is by attending closely to how the written word is spelled and then linking that sequence of letters to the word's pronunciation and its meaning. So a very simple example, a child knows the meaning and pronunciation of the word cat. The word gets orthographically mapped to her memory when she links the sounds cat to the word, written word, C-A-T. So this requires an awareness of the speech sounds in words, phonemic awareness. It requires an understanding of how those sounds are represented by letters, that's phonics. So you need phonemic awareness and phonics to orthographically map words into your long-term memory. Once a word has been orthographically mapped to your memory, you know it instantly on sight. In fact, you cannot suppress your ability to read that word. You don't have to sound out the word when you see it. You know it instantly because at some point you successfully sounded it out and you linked the spelling of the word with the word's pronunciation and its meaning. So by about second grade, a typically developing reader who's acquired good phonemic awareness and phonics skills needs just a few exposures to a word through its pronunciation, its spelling and its meaning and bam, the word is orthographically mapped to her memory. Now, the more words that she maps to her memory this way, the more she can focus on the meaning of what she's reading. She's not using her brain power to identify words. She's using her brain power to understand what she's reading. And this is the goal, for readers to comprehend what they're reading. For some reason, debates about reading have ended up stuck in an argument about whether teachers should focus on helping kids learn to decode words or whether they should focus on reading comprehension. But that debate makes no sense. How can you fully comprehend what you're reading if you can't accurately read the words? So let me give you another orthographic mapping example. A few years ago when my son was uh, in about 10th grade, he was reading something out loud to me and he said, epitome. So I stopped him and I asked, epitome, do you mean epitome? So there's the word. Oh, my son said, you could practically see the light bulbs going off in his head, epitome. My son had obviously heard that word before. Maybe he had a basic sort of gist of it kind of idea of what the word means. He may have come across the word in print before too, paused, sounded it out, epitome, hmm, don't know that word. But now reading aloud to me, he had had the aha moment he needed to realize that's a word I know. So we briefly discussed the meaning of the word. Here it is, epitome, a person or thing that's a perfect example of a particular type or quality. So the next time my son sees that word in print, he's gonna know what it is. And the science suggests that with another few exposures, that word will be permanently stored in his memory. He'll see it and know it. 
the spelling, the pronunciation, the meaning, it'll all be there for him. What scientists have discovered is that skilled word reading is like a reflex. It's not a detective game. It's not contextual guessing. It's not a series of strategic actions. It's automatic and it's effortless. However, as, as you can see in the example of my son, there is much more than decoding skill at play. Readers must have a good oral vocabulary. My son had heard the word epitome. The light bulbs wouldn't have gone off for him if he hadn't. Your ability to comprehend what you read <clears throat> is tightly linked to your vocabulary and your knowledge. That's one reason that reading scores tend to be associated with family income and educational background. Knowing the meaning of lots of words gives you an advantage, an edge, when it comes to orthographic mapping and when it comes to understanding what you read. And having a mom who hears you read epitome and clues you into the fact that the word is epitome, well, that helps a whole lot too. Family background matters. It can tilt the scales in your favor, especially on the language comprehension side of things. But having a big oral vocabulary and lots of knowledge isn't enough. By some estimates, a third of struggling readers are from college-educated families. Children need to be taught how to read the words on the page. <clears throat> Excuse me. They need to be taught how their written language works. And when teachers use the cueing system that I told you about, when they teach all those word reading strategies, they're actually impeding the orthographic mapping progress, uh, process. So let me explain that with a story. So these are first graders in Oakland, California. So a teacher who worked with these girls came to see that teaching the cueing system or that MSV idea, meaning structure visual, that was actually making it harder for her students to learn how to read. The teacher's name is Margaret Goldberg. She was hired by the Oakland Unified School District to teach level literacy intervention. LLI is the reading intervention program that I mentioned that was developed by Irene Fountas and Gay Sue Pinnell. LLI does include some phonics instruction. It also teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they have lots of strategies for figuring out the word. They can sound it out, but they can also use pictures and context and other cues to try to come up with a good guess. So Margaret Goldberg started teaching LLI. Around the same time, she found a bunch of unopened materials sitting on a shelf in her school collecting dust. And it was a systematic phonics and phonemic awareness program that teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they sound it out. And kids in this program practice reading in books that contain words with spelling patterns that they've been taught. So they don't have to guess at words. Margaret started teaching some of her groups LLI with the cueing strategies. And some of her groups she taught systematic phonics and phonemic awareness with no cueing. And she started to notice differences between the two groups of children, not just in how well they were reading, but in the way they approached their reading. So she and a colleague recorded first graders talking about what makes them good readers. So I'm going to play this video for you. Mia's in the white shirt. She was learning phonics with no cueing. And Jabri is in the pink jacket. She was taught the cueing system. Yes, what makes you good readers? I learn a lot. Because I look at the pictures and I read it. Ooh. Do you remember when you were little and you didn't know how to read? Yes. Like when you started kind kindergarten? Of. Yeah. What helped you learn how to read? How did you learn? By looking, looking at, at the pictures. Anything else? Looking at the words and sounding them out. So Margaret Goldberg was seeing this over and over again in her two groups of students. One group was taking away from their reading instruction that reading is about looking closely at words and sounding them out. And another group of children was learning that when you come to a word you don't know, you don't have to look at it carefully and try to connect the spelling with the pronunciation and the meaning. Instead, you can look away from the word. You can look at the pictures, you can look at the other words in the sentence. Basically, you search around for clues to help you identify the word. Now remember, orthographic mapping requires you to look carefully at words so your brain links the spelling with the sounds and the meaning. But cueing teaches kids to look away from words. Here's what Margaret Goldberg said to me about the children in her LLI groups. I did lasting damage to these kids. It was so hard to ever get them to stop looking at a picture to guess what a word would be. It was so hard to ever get them to slow down and sound a word out because they had had this experience of knowing that you predict what you read before you read it. As Margaret was noticing the differences between her two groups of students, she was discovering the scientific research on reading. It was not stuff she knew or had been taught. She was shocked by what she was learning and how different it was from what the curriculum materials, materials were telling her about how reading works. 
But what Margaret was learning from the curriculum materials about how reading works is what lots of teachers are learning about how reading works. Instructional approaches that include cueing are all over American classrooms. A lot of kids are being taught phonics and they're also being taught cueing. Now, some children can overcome this contradiction. They figure out pretty quickly that sounding out a word is the most efficient way to know what it is. They drop the cueing strategies and begin building that big bank of instantly recognizable words that is so crucial for becoming a skilled reader. But some kids cling to the cueing strategies because those are easier at first. And by using cueing strategies, many children can look like good readers, especially when they have good language comprehension skills. They can look like good readers until they get to about <clears throat> third or fourth grade, when their books begin to have more words, longer words, and fewer pictures. And then they're stuck. They haven't developed their word reading skills. Reading is slow and laborious, and they don't like it, so they don't do it if they don't have to. And while their peers who mastered decoding early are reading and teaching themselves new words every day, the kids who clung to the cueing approach with all those word reading strategies I showed you before, those kids are falling further and further behind. So <clears throat> At a Loss for Words is a podcast episode and article where I tried to explain the problems with the cueing and strategies approach to teaching reading. As I said earlier, a lot of schools seem to be doing some kind of phonics instruction these days. And most publishers know that they need to have some kind of phonics instruction in place for the materials to have a chance of being considered research-based. But just because a school has added phonics does not mean that reading instruction aligns with the scientific research on reading. If children are being taught the cueing research, they're being taught to read the way that poor readers read. This, I think, is a big elephant in the room when it comes to reading instruction in the United States today. Schools and publishers are adding what I've come to think of as a phonics patch. They're checking the phonics box, but they're still teaching cueing. Why? This is a million dollar question, literally. It's a million dollar question because schools have invested a lot of money in instructional materials that teach kids cueing. And schools are better at adding things than they are at taking things away. In other words, it's easier to add phonics than to take away cueing. And many educators believe in cueing. I got an email from a woman who teaches in an upper middle class suburb, a school district with good test scores compared to many school districts in this country. She says the cueing and strategies approach to teaching reading is alive and well in her district. And she has tried to talk to her colleagues about the scientific research on reading, but telling them about the problems with the cueing and strategies approach to teaching reading, she says she has to be really careful about that because she said, it's like walking into a church and yelling, there's no God. Many educators believe in cueing because if they were taught anything about how reading works, they were very likely taught that idea that readers use meaning, structure, and visual cues to identify words as they're reading. They were taught the theory of reading that whole language is based on. They may not think they are teaching whole language, but whole language ideas about how reading skill develops are deeply embedded in their curriculum materials and what they learn in professional development and what they learned in their teacher preparation programs often. <clears throat> and Cueing seems to work for some kids because some kids, maybe even most kids in some schools and classrooms, will learn to read no matter how they're taught. They will learn to read in spite of the instruction. They're that 40% in Nancy Young's letter of reading. They learn to read no matter how they're taught. Learning to read is relatively easy for them. But reading is not natural. And for most children, learning to read is actually pretty hard. They need more help than they typically get in school. Because reading instruction in many schools rests on the assumption that most kids will figure out what they need to know about written language with some guidance and access to a lot of good books. Reading instruction tends to rest on the assumption that learning to read is not that hard for most people. And we need to flip the script. Acknowledge that for most humans, learning to read is actually pretty challenging. And a lot of them aren't going to become good readers and spellers without a lot of good help. This is normal. But right now, literacy instruction is tilted in favor of the minority of people who do not need much instruction to become good readers. And literacy instruction that is tilted in favor of the few is inequitable at its core. It favors those with financial resources, for example, because if they can't get what they need in school, someone will pay for what they need. <clears throat> so this is a picture of Skippy the frog and his friends, and actually they're in a trash barrel. It's a little hard to tell from the picture. A teacher sent this picture to me. 
I have heard from a lot of teachers who are throwing away Skippy and all of those other word reading strategies that distract kids from the thing that will help them best develop good word recognition skills, looking carefully at words and sounding them out, as Mia the first grader said in the video. But change is hard, always is. And while the science of reading is really well established, it doesn't mean how to teach reading has been settled. I think this is a really important point. The simple view of reading, for example, does not say that reading is simple. It says that reading comprehension can be divided into two parts. It's a simple model for understanding something that's complex. Reading is complex and teaching kids to read is complex. And there's no perfect curriculum. There's no perfect approach. There's no perfect sequence of what to teach. There probably never will be. I think the key to improving reading instruction is teacher knowledge making sure teachers know about the huge body of research on how skilled reading develops. When they know this, they begin to see on their own what is flawed about Skippy the Frog. I have talked to lots of teachers who have had this aha moment for themselves when they dig into the research. But as educators make an effort to move away from flawed practices that are rooted in some ideas that have turned out not to be correct about reading, it's important really to acknowledge good things that came from whole language, for example, and to remember that whole language emerged in the 1960s and 70s in response to concerns about how reading was being taught. So in some schools, there was an emphasis on the decoding and word recognition side of things without much emphasis on the other stuff. So maybe there was phonics instruction, but there wasn't enough focus on the bigger picture, the language comprehension, the knowledge building, the vocabulary development. Whole language came along as a challenge to traditional phonics instruction. Whole language of the 1960s was not informed by the scientific research, because that research was yet to come, but neither was traditional phonics instruction. We were doing phonics instruction long before we really know how kids learn to read. So it's important for everyone who cares about kids being taught to read in ways that line up with the scientific evidence to look closely at phonics instruction too. Phonics instruction may focus too much on sounds and symbols and not enough on other things that a child needs to know to understand how written English works, for example. Some phonics advocates sometimes fail to appreciate the language comprehension part of the equation. I hear from teachers and tutors and researchers about this. They see kids being explicitly taught how letters and sounds work, but not being asked to then connect this enough to reading, not being asked to apply what they're learning to comprehension. In classrooms that are trying hard to get foundational skills right, there may not be enough time devoted to the development of language comprehension and knowledge. So that's inequitable instruction too. So as I begin to wrap up, I want to say just a few things about teachers. <laughs> as an education reporter, I have spent countless hours in classrooms observing instruction, talking to teachers about what they do. Two big takeaways from that, we ask a lot of our teachers in this country. And teaching is really hard to do well. It takes an incredible amount of expertise and experience. This country does not value good teaching as much as it should. In fact, the opposite. Teachers are often underappreciated and underpaid. And as Dana Goldstein of the New York Times wrote a few years ago, teaching has become the most controversial profession in America. Why is that? Well, I think it rooted has to do with the fact that teaching is so important. What children learn in school, it really matters. And it especially matters that they're taught how to read. Reading is a foundation upon which all other academic learning is built. Reading is a key, the key. I hear from some teachers who feel right now that they are being blamed for poor reading skills. They don't like this science of reading conversation because they hear it as part of this blame game. So Margaret Goldberg, the literacy coach in Oakland, who I told you about before, she actually wrote a blog post that addresses this. It's called Teachers Won't Embrace Research Until It Embraces Them. And it begins like this. Margaret wrote, I understand why advocates, researchers, and policymakers who feel the urgency of our literacy crisis are frustrated when teachers don't embrace reading science. But my entry into the world of reading research was difficult. And while I take pride in my determination to learn, I understand why other teachers might be deterred. If we want teachers to apply research, it may be helpful to think about why they aren't. Asking teachers to move away from balanced literacy is asking them to break from the people and materials they have trusted, to abandon much of what they've been told about teaching, and to rethink things that may have inspired them to enter the profession. If we want teachers to walk away from a familiar and empathetic professional community, they need to be warmly welcomed into something new. And the piece includes this chart, which I think I have time to read this to you because I don't know if you all can see this very well. So let's see. I'm going to read this to you real quick. Here's what her chart says. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was an expert because I was told you know your students best. In the reading science community, I found that teachers were described as unprepared and ineffective. 
In the balanced literacy community, I felt that reading was described in terms that match my own memory of learning to read, natural and magical. In the reading science community, I found that reading was a complex neurological process that I didn't understand, and phrases like curriculum casualties and reading failure terrified me. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that my role was simple and pleasurable because I believe students learn to read by reading. I match students with books while watching and encouraging their progress. In the reading science community, I found that I'd be to blame if any of my students did not become skilled readers. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was a good reader. Books and articles were enjoyable, easy to read, and often included anecdotes to which I could relate. In the reading science community, I found that articles included words I'd never encountered before, concepts I didn't understand, graphs I couldn't read, and references to studies I didn't know. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was welcomed and spoken to with respect, if not with admiration, by the presenters. They understood my job. I left with concrete strategies to try with my students the next day. In the reading science community, I found that at conferences, I was not the intended audience, and comments about teachers not only made me feel unwelcome, but discouraged me from inviting my colleagues. I left rethinking important ideas, but without knowing how to apply what I've learned. And finally, in the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was aligned with my colleagues, my supervisors, the people who trained me, and the educators I knew to admire. But in the reading science community, I found that I became an outsider in my district until I connected with others, I felt alone. So I think it's really important for people who are trying to advance the science of reading to think about this chart. Teachers need support. They need help translating the research into practice. And some of them are feeling attacked. I've tried very hard in my reporting not to blame teachers. I don't know of a teacher who does not want to teach her or his students how to read. But too many teachers are not being taught what they need to know to be able to do that. That is unfair to teachers and it is unfair to kids. I will end with something I saw on Twitter. It was in response to someone expressing concern that teachers are being turned off by the science of reading conversation. The person posted this. As the conversation around reading practice builds, I'm worried that we're losing a lot of teachers right now. And here was one of the replies. I often wonder if there's a way to reframe the conversation, to portray this as an absolutely amazing time to be in education, a moonshot. To say helping every kid read proficiently is hard and means doing things in a new way, but we can do it. So thank you for your time today. I will leave you with my contact information and a web page where you can find all of the APM Reports podcasts and articles about reading. It's all collected in one place. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. It was a powerful and inspiring keynote as we knew it would be. Thank you so very, very much for joining us for the Patent Literacy Symposium. Uh, session started in 15 minutes, 945. And again, thank you, Emily. We are truly honored that you joined us. Thank you so very much. That was a little by radio ho hosting days. I ended right at 930. I can't believe it. I was watching the clock. You got to get right on when you're on the radio. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>